Did you know that aquaculture is the fastest growing segment of agriculture? In fact, for the last 35 years, aquaculture production has grown at an annual average rate of 8.4%, and it's playing an increasingly important role in global food production. Today, more than 50% of the edible seafood comes from aquaculture. So what exactly is aquaculture? My name is David Klein and I'll be your guide today through this short presentation that will introduce you to aquaculture, show you some examples, and explain why it is important and how it relates to you. If you look at these four photographs, you will see that one is different than the rest. Can you guess which one is not an example of aquaculture? The fishing boat rigged for trawling is not a form of aquaculture. Modern fishing is really a sophisticated form of hunting and gathering. Seafood is one of the last major protein sources that is hunted rather than farmed. The other photos, a halibut farm in Scotland, catfish and tilapia raceways in Arkansas, or oyster farming along Alabama's coast are all different forms of aquaculture. But what exactly is aquaculture? Aquaculture is the reproduction and growth of aquatic plants and animals in a controlled or semi-controlled environment. It's also often referred to as fish farming. We use the term semi-controlled because any outdoor system is subject to the influence of Mother Nature. Even ponds in the same soil, with the same water, treated in the same way, will often look and react very differently. Each is its own individual microcosm. Mariculture refers to aquaculture conducted in salt water. Shrimp, salmon, oysters, and algae production are common examples of mariculture. Aquaculture is most often associated with the production of food, but there are many other uses of aquaculture products. Sport fish like the largemouth bass are grown in hatcheries and released into public waters or are purchased for private pond recreational fishing. Other fish and plants are also grown as ornamentals, like the koi or the lotus. There are even aquaculture products used for medicinal and industrial purposes. Did you know that there is seaweed in ice cream and makeup? These happen to be freshwater examples, but the same holds true for marine species. Aquatic organisms are cultured using a variety of techniques. Each system has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Fish are most often raised in either ponds, cages, raceways, or recirculating systems. When you start talking about shellfish and aquatic plants, there's a whole different set of technologies, but we'll leave that for another presentation. Ponds are the dominant production system for freshwater fish. Catfish is the most dominant aquaculture species in the United States and accounts for one-third of the 1.1 billion dollar U.S. industry. In January 2013, the USDA National Agriculture Statistics Service reported that there are 83,000 acres of water being used for catfish production. In other parts of the world, aquaculture plays an even larger role in the production of protein. These ponds near a metropolitan area in China provide convenient access and steady supply of fresh fish, and you can see that they're an integral part of the landscape. Fish can also be grown in cages. Cages come in all shapes and sizes. Small cages may contain only a few hundred fish, but large sea cages may reach a hundred meters in diameter and contain tens of thousands of fish. Having fish in a confined area makes it easy to harvest and manage them, but the high intensity of this culture method requires additional skill and management. Raceways are long, narrow channels with constantly flowing water. Fish culture in raceways requires large quantities of high-quality water that is generally supplied by gravity. Sites suitable for raceways are very limited and strict wastewater monitoring is required. Recirculating aquaculture systems use filters and aeration to continually clean and recycle water. An aquarium is an example of a small recirculating aquaculture system. 
Larger examples of recirculating aquaculture systems include bait holding setups and demonstration systems like this high school aquaculture project. Large commercial and public aquariums are also recirculating aquaculture systems. And even large scale outdoor production systems like this one. Recirculating aquaculture systems typically use less water and can raise large quantities of fish in a small area. However, these systems often require substantial startup capital and highly trained managers to be successful. The production of any aquatic crop involves multiple steps. Many of these steps are consistent between species. Some of the steps include broodstock selection, controlled reproduction, egg care and management, larval rearing, feeding, maintaining water quality, harvesting, processing, transportation, and marketing. Let's use the cat channel catfish as an example. One key element to successful aquaculture production is the selection of good brood stock. These fish are selected based on traits considered most valuable to the species. These are prime examples of catfish brood stock showing strong secondary sex characteristics. You can see that the male in the top of the photo has the desired raised muscle pads on the top of the head, and the female has a rounded belly full of eggs. Catfish like to spawn in sheltered locations, so catfish farmers will put out spawning containers in two to four feet of water. The male catfish will clean and prepare the can for spawning and then try to attract a female. After several days, the farmer will check the spawning cans by slowly raising them out of the water. They will often find the male fish still in the can caring for the eggs. That's why it's always a good idea to look in the can before putting your hand in to check for eggs. If eggs are present, the farmer will gently remove them and transport them in water to the hatchery. In the hatchery, the eggs are placed in baskets in a trough with slowly rotating paddles. These paddles mimic the movement of the male catfish's tail sweeping over the eggs, keeping them clean, and providing them with plenty of fresh oxygen. As the eggs develop, they change from a light yellow color to a rusty red color. Inside the egg, the embryo develops until it's ready to hatch. When the eggs hatch, they have a large yolk sac attached that will feed the fish for several days. The farmers need to know how many fry they have so they can accurately stock them into ponds. Several samples of the fry are counted and weighed and using the sample data, the rest of the fry can be counted either using volumetric displacement or by weight. Once counted, the sack fry are placed in a larger trough. Once the yolk sac is absorbed, the fish will begin to turn black and swim to the top looking for feed. At this point, they're called swim-up fry. They are fed four to eight times a day until they grow strong enough to be put into the fingerling ponds. Once the fish are moved to a pond, they're fed a pelleted feed. The initial feed is very small, and as the fish grows, the farmer will use larger and larger pellets. The feed contains primarily soybeans, corn, cottonseed meal, wheat, as well as a full complement of vitamins and minerals to help the fish grow fast and stay healthy. Feed is distributed across the pond surface using a truck or tractor and a feed hopper with a blower. Many feed hoppers have an integrated scale and control box inside the truck so operators can manage and record how much feed is added to the pond. Distributing feed over a large area allows all sizes of fish equal access to the food. Catfish farmers may feed upwards of 100 pounds per acre per day of feed during the summer months. That's a lot of nutrients going into the pond. Farmers have to closely monitor water quality to ensure optimum growing conditions. One of the most dynamic aspects of water quality is oxygen. 
oxygen levels rise and fall during the day and tend to be their lowest just before sunrise. Sometimes mechanical aeration is used to increase oxygen levels. This electric paddle wheel aerator is designed to lift large quantities of water about two feet into the air and break it into small droplets. Breaking the water into small droplets creates a large surface area and makes it easy for the oxygen from the surrounding air to diffuse into the water. You can see that it creates quite a current that helps circulate the water and oxygen. Fish will often line up behind one of these aerators during a low oxygen event. After about 18 months, the fish reach a market size of about 2 pounds and are ready for harvest. Long nets called seines are stretched across the ponds. As the tractors pull the seine through the pond, the fish are funneled into a smaller detachable box-shaped net called a live car. In this scene, farmers are testing a new seine that incorporates greater bars into the seine that allow smaller fish to escape and reduces the number of fish that get stuck in the net. The fish are then allowed time to settle down and the smaller fish grade out before being loaded onto a truck for transport. The fish are lifted out of the live car and loaded onto a truck using a boom and basket. The fish are weighed with a scale connected to the boom and placed into a tank of water on the truck. The tanks are supplied with oxygen to ensure that the fish arrive alive at the processing plant. Once the fish arrive at the processing plant, they're unloaded, reweighed, and processed into a variety of product forms. Some of the fish are shipped out fresh, but the majority is individually quick frozen for easy transport to distributors, restaurants, and seafood retailers. And eventually, the catfish makes its way to your plate in a tasty dish like this one. These steps and processes are also used with many other species. It's estimated that there are more than 350 species in aquaculture production worldwide. Here are just a few that provide food, recreation, medicine, and enjoyment for people in the U.S. and around the world. Now let's look at how aquaculture fits into the global food production picture and how it's becoming more and more important. The annual consumption of seafood in the U.S. has been on the rise for the last 30 years. Consumption data for 2011 indicates that the average American eats 15 pounds of seafood per year. There is a similar growth trend in global seafood consumption, but the worldwide average per capita consumption is 37.3 pounds, more than double that of the average U.S. consumer. The increase in consumption, along with population growth, continues to expand the demand for seafood. The level of the catch from the ocean has been relatively stable for the last 25 years. The light blue portion of the graph indicates the capture portion of seafood production, and you can see that it's been stabilized at around 90 million metric tons for quite a while. The dark blue portion indicates the increasing contribution of aquaculture products to the world production. Today, about 50% of all edible seafood comes from aquaculture. This graph shows the value of seafood imported and exported from the United States. The green bars represent the value of seafood exported from the U.S., and the dark blue bar indicates the value of seafood imported. In 2011, the value of seafood exports was $5.4 billion, while the value of the imports was $16.6 billion. The blue-green colored bars in the lower half of the graph indicate the trade balance between imports and exports. You can see that there is a large and growing seafood trade deficit. In fact, in 2011 the deficit reached $11.2 billion. Major components of the imports include shrimp, salmon, tilapia, and shellfish. So what does $11.2 billion look like? We hear from the government talk about billions and trillions of dollars, but to put this figure into a context that we can visualize, $11.2 billion is equivalent to 7.5 tractor-trailer trucks filled floor-to-ceiling and wall-to-wall with $20 bills. 
So where are all those imports coming from? Let's look at the big producers. China is the world's largest aquaculture producer and accounts for 61.4 percent of the total world production. Areas in Asia outside of China account for another 27.6 percent. Together they account for 89 percent of the global total. Despite being the second largest seafood consumer worldwide, the United States produces less than 1 percent of the total aquaculture supply. Each year we import more than nine billion dollars worth from Asia alone. So how does all of this affect you? If you eat seafood or are interested in our food supply in general, you must realize that the ocean is not the boundless resource we once thought. Today more than seventy percent of major ocean species are fully exploited, in decline from overfishing, or are in a state of recovery. Between the population growth, the growth of the middle class in developing countries like China and India, and increasing seafood consumption in general, it's estimated that the global demand will double within the next 30 years. Why else should you be interested? Let's just say it has to do with your health. The American Medical Association and the USDA recommends that Americans eat seafood twice a week. At this point, we're eating less than half of the recommended amount. Americans are having more and more health and weight issues and doctors point out that seafood is a healthy source of protein and a good source of heart healthy omega-3 fatty acids. Wild caught fish are often touted as more healthy than farm raised fish but the benefits of aquaculture cannot be ignored. Control of the feed and the quality of the water in aquaculture systems minimize the risk of contamination and ensure a wholesome high quality and reliable product. The bottom line is, is that aquaculture is going to play an increasingly significant role in global food supply. It will be especially critical in developing countries. It's important that we learn more about our food supply, where it comes from, and how it gets to our plate. The U.S. seafood supply is heavily dependent on imports and therefore is not very secure. By purchasing U.S. farm-raised aquaculture products, we can both support our domestic aqua farmers and increase our food security. It's your responsibility to become an educated consumer so you can make good decisions on how to buy and what to eat. That way, you too can become part of the Blue Revolution. If you'd like to learn more about aquaculture in the U.S. and around the world, here are several great resources. Each year, the FAO, or Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, puts together a status update of fisheries and aquaculture. The National Aquaculture Association, the NAA, and the USDA National Statistics Service also keep up-to-date information. And about every five years, they conduct a detailed aquaculture census that provides detailed information on species, volumes, and values. Thanks again for your time and interest, and be sure to check out the wealth of aquaculture information available on the SRAC website as well as alearn.info. The Southern Regional Aquaculture Center website has hundreds more publications, fact sheets, and presentations just like this one. Thanks, and have a great day.